Welcome to the Combat Learning Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Peacock. If you aren't already, please go to combatlearning.com slash newsletter to get subscribed to updates on the podcast and training resources. To say thanks, I'll give you my transfer cheat sheet, a simple list of do's and don'ts for how to design your practice activities for maximum effectiveness. If you've ever wondered if your training methods are going to transfer to competition or self-defense, this cheat sheet is for you. Plus, I'll send you my little ebook, The Introduction to Motor Learning for Martial Arts, to get you up to speed on what we're talking about. Go to combatlearning.com slash newsletter to claim that now. Today, I'm joined by Greg Souders, a third-degree black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu and the owner of an academy called Standard Jiu-Jitsu. In this episode, Greg reveals how he runs a totally, radically ecological grappling program where he doesn't even teach techniques in the way we've always seen them taught. Greg has stripped down everything we take for granted about teaching martial arts and rebuilt his program around the ecological dynamics and constraints-led coaching frameworks. He's changed everything, even the way he talks about jujitsu to his students, which frankly, I think might be revolutionary. If you're wondering how he introduces submissions to new students, teaches passing and pinning, designs practices, or manipulates constraints, or even how he coaches or cues his athletes, all those questions will be answered during the course of this show. Before I hand you off to the interview, be sure to visit the Standard Jiu-Jitsu Instagram account linked in the podcast description. There you'll find concrete visual examples of how Greg Souders guides his students to learn submissions without teaching them through the usual lectures, demonstration, repetitions, and drills. He's also had two prior interviews on the podcast of my friend Scott Sievrights, a highly recommended podcast called Primal MMA Coaching Podcast. Links are also in the description. Definitely check those out as well. So if you're excited to jump in, hit the subscribe button on your podcatcher and enjoy the show. Well, uh, welcome to the Combat Learning Podcast. Um, if you would, go ahead and introduce yourself and your martial arts background to the audience so they kind of know where you came from um, so we can contrast that with how far you've come now. Oh, yeah, for sure. So uh, my name is Greg Souders. I started doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu back in 2004. I actually remember my first day. It was February 10th, 2004. That was the very first time my feet stepped on the mat. Nice. Uh, I was 19 years old. Uh and I fell in love right away. Uh, for that first that first week I trained, I trained six days that week, and I've literally been on the mats every single day. You know, minus a few, uh, a little bit of injury setback. But uh, for eight, the last eighteen years, that's what I've been doing. Um, my main focus when I first started uh, training was I wanted to be a high level competitor. I was interested right away, so I trained almost exclusively with the gi on the gi jiu jitsu for twelve years uh, straight. Uh, I did do some no-gi competition here and there, but it really wasn't my forte. I, I wasn't really interested in it as an art itself. Um, but yeah, so that was kind of uh, when I started and what my original path was. And then uh, I, I started training under a man named Lloyd Urban. He was my my coach. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, he, you know, you guys can look him up if you'd like, but uh, that's where I learned all of my jiu-jitsu from. And then I left his team in 2013 and, and started my own in 2014. Uh, called Standard Jiu Jitsu, um, and yeah, so I've been a, a coach and school owner since then. Uh, in 2016, I uh, stopped training with the gi on and I started going down the no gi path, and I've been doing that ever since. Um, uh, yeah, so that's my jiu jitsu history. Nice. Do you do you train exclusively no gi now, or do you still do yeah, gi? Exclusively no gi. I'll never put the jacket back on again. Nice. I've I've been moving that way myself. The place I train at now is more MMA focused, so um, they don't do any. They don't do any gi. It's just no gi. And before that, I didn't really like it. I was more of a gi guy. But now right. that I've been forced to acclimate, um, I kind of like the I kind of like the no gi better. It's it feels pure, feels simpler, and it's better for my fingers. <laughs> no, no, true. I mean, my fingers were I couldn't open a a soda bottle or a, a, you know, a jar of spaghetti sauce. My fingers were wrecked. Damn. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I it's funny because I came to the realization that in two, that around 2016 is that. We're not really learning how to grapple with the gi on. I don't mean that. Well, I, I can explain that more deeply if you want, but we're learning how to yeah. jacket wrestle. We're learning how to use a jacket to control a body. We're not learning how to use a body to control a body. And that that's kind of the big realization I came to. And I was like, man, I really want to make it more fundamental. I want to strip everything down and find like the core of the, the grappling art, so to speak. And so that's why. 
Yeah, the, no, that's funny. We sh- I want to get into that um, because that that's actually a perfect segue to my first talking point was really to talk about global and local invariant features of jujitsu and, and the and the the system as we we use the word system in in a certain way coming from an ecological perspective. Um, so I think that really is a great segue to that because we're that's what we're really talking about. What aspects of grappling are common to all of grappling sure. versus just dr- jacket wrestling, which is a particular type of wrestling. For sure. I, I tell my students, like we can look at it as like a grappling is the umbrella that covers all the sporting rule sets. Uh, the sport and the rules under which it's engaged are a constraint in and of itself and will sort of guide the emergence of certain behavior qualities. Uh, and so if you have cloth on, uh, we know that cloth allows you to create torque at, uh, or force at a distance, allows you to create torque, more torque on the body. So we're going to be more inclined to grab at the ends, the collars, sleeves, things like that. Uh, and wherever the jacket is touching exhibits control over the skeleton. So uh, this changes how we uh, create the perception and action coupling to certain aspects of control. So anyway, it just, yeah. it, it's just, a, it's a thing in and of itself. And so it's not yeah. pure grappling. It's, it's, a, it's a tear down from grappling in my, in my little stupid mental model here, like as I define grappling, but mm-hmm. grappling is the act of, of nothing else, but two bodies anyway. So yeah, jack wrestling is an aspect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, perception action couplings or, or information movement couplings. I think those are the same concepts from two corners of the ecological dynamics, but, um, it also, uh, it dictates specifying information because sure. if you're jacket wrestling, you're, <coughs> you're going to tend towards, I mean, some people are more wrestling focused even in the gi, but you're going to tend towards what is going to give you the most leverage right. without expending, um, too much energy. And so what you're looking for where your attention is directed, the information that you're paying attention to, some of that's going to be different than if you're just purely wrestling, like they did back in, you know, Greek, ancient Greece. <laughs> oh, this, well, you're bringing up a very interesting topic, and for two reasons, I think. Uh, so one is, I mean, jiu-jitsu, the gentle art. I, I mean, I'm not telling you what Jigoro Kano originally meant, you know, when he talked about judo. I mean, he writes about it extensively, but right. uh, by, by gentle, I think he really was trying to get at the idea of efficiency. I mean, so we want more for less. And so that, that is the foundational philosophy. So what, what I teach my guys is jujitsu is the philosophical lens at which we look at the sport of grappling. Um, and so that's kind of a, what we keep as our philosophical basis for one of the reasons why we uh, select tactics, mechanics, or strategies is we try to look at uh, the human physical system um, uh, and it's uti- uh, how, we, how we're in, in, uh, interacting with it for the purpose of, of maximizing efficiency. And then the second thing is a lot of people see the difference between like, let's say jacket wrestling and wrestling. And they think there's this like, oh, wrestlers, are these powerful physical beasts and they're, they're not using uh, efficiency. Well, they are. It's just that there are certain grappling tactics or positioned in grappling that require greater levels of energy dump. And so when we're talking about like the standing engagement, for example, where we can't control at range and there are no wedges holding the body still, the amount of energy that needs to be out, that needs to be output to put, or excuse me, that needs to be input to put somebody on the floor is a lot higher than it would be if I were able to grab a hold of somebody's cloth that's already attached to their body at a distance and then try to put them on the floor. Uh, it just looks uh, a little bit different. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> an interesting point on the, 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 the Jew being translated to um, gentle. It's also translated to soft sometimes, but what's lost in translation, and this is based on some reading of like, like traditional martial arts nerds way back in the day that are, that yeah. like know Japanese and everything. They, um, some guys I was reading on like some old website that doesn't even exist anymore, like koru.com or something like that. Um, they were saying that, that Jew has this connotation uh, of, um, adaptability or pliance. So it's ability to be flexible and, and adapt this connotation of like being pliant or adaptable, Mm -hmm. like water filling up a, you know, and do which, which really that actually goes well with, with the ecological side of things, even though their idea of how that works is not how we would approach it. Like the Japanese, the traditional Japanese approach to training is very like kata oriented, like no matter what you do, but what was interesting about the kata concept, actually, something I, I know personally, is like Jiro Kata wrote about this. Uh, he didn't use kata. So his uh, idea was to break away from kata. So that was like one of yeah. his, 
big masterful thoughts. I mean, because before he came up with his live training or Endori, everything was practiced um, like as a dance or as an exchange. Mm-hmm. And he was like, well, this isn't true because we don't know what would actually happen if, if two people were to not only do this at full power, but do this at full power to each other every day. So he was like, what can we do where we're using true our, our, you know, our true energy like, and not hurt each other? What would actually come out? And that was one of his original questions. Um, and so yeah, Kata was something he actually got away from. And what's been that's even more interesting with the, with the drilling concept. It's like this guy creates a way to engage in combat that removes drilling as the main mechanism for discovery. And then mm-hmm. it's now heavily reintroduced in our community as the way uh, to yeah. learn skills. So anyway, yeah. So yeah. I have a I have a hypothesis about that, but that's not this is not the, the place for that, I guess. We can talk about that later. Hey, yeah, no worries. Uh, no worries. Um so yeah, so I, I want to talk about the um I mentioned it before, the global and local invariant invariant features. Can you explain what those are and how that helps you approach the way you train your own athletes? Yeah. So we first start, we actually start with just an idea about how we're trying to approach engagement. Okay. So we're looking at at the fight as it's expressed by the human physical system. Mm-hmm. And so we're trying to use the body as the objective factor. So uh our environmental constraint based on the task we're trying to perform is the human body. So how does it move? Why does it stand this way versus this way? What are the reasons it orients itself in the world to do these, you know, these basic things? Right. We use that to help guide what we would call our, our you know, global and local invariants. So global being things that never change. So for example, in, in, a, in, a, in a combat sport, once uh, the fight starts to engage and someone hits the floor, there's always a top and bottom per- person, for example, right? There's always a top and bottom person and never changes. So, in order to to do any any tactics from the top position, you have two foundational tasks you must always be performing that takes priority of all others, and that's to stay on top and to hold your partner down. So those two task constraints never go away for the top person. They are the foundation of top position. So whether you're trying to hold them out, you're trying to hold the top of half guard, you're trying to hold, you're trying to stand on top of somebody using belly up open guard. All, all your, all the information you're picking up, all the, you know, perception action company you're creating, all the, all the decisions you're making have to do with those two things first. That's why we call them global invariants. Mm-hmm. Um, now, for local, these will be things that start to happen when specific alignments start to take place. So let's say I'm in top position and I'm in the chest to chest half guard alignment. What do I need to focus on to, or what, where am I trying to pull information from to perform specific actions within that specific alignment? And then we would have, we would have local rules for, for that engagement, like, uh, keeping chest to chest coverage, making mm-hmm. sure we're always keeping, um, uh, our wedges aligned with, uh, the shoulders and hips, things like that, you know? And now I'm just using this language to talk to you. If I were to talk, tell a student about that, I wouldn't tell them to, uh, like, to focus on their own body. We would find external factors to, to teach right. them this, but yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> analysis is different. Your analysis as a coach is different than how you actually coach somebody. 100%. And which I think that... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, which is something that most coaches don't understand. They think that they, because they've had an insight about how their own body works or how they see other people moving, that they need to tell them to move that way or to tell them about the insight and that that will produce skilled movement of that capacity. And it just almost never does. It's mind blowing to me. I, I, I watch I, I watch instructionals now for the purpose of like, just kind of <laughs> like cynically judging it because I, I, I look at them like they're, they're, what they're saying is not even helpful. They'll be like, okay, put your arm here first. Then you put your elbow here. Then you, and I'm like, okay, you're telling me what you're doing. I, I can see that with my eyes. You don't even need to say anything. Mm-hmm. Why are these happening? Like, when am I going to have the opportunity? Is it just, is that grip important? Just it's that grip or does it have many functions or, or are there different places I could put my hand for the same? I mean, like, I don't know what you're telling me. Like there's no information. There's no conveyance of information between why you're doing this uh, and what you're doing. There, there's none. And so anyway, mm-hmm. I'm just, I'm always blown away that they can't see that. Yeah. People think, and I, 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 you know, as a younger instructor, I, when I was teaching, I um, fell into this too, because I'm a fairly articulate person. So I can come up with all these ways and and I and I got praised for it too, right? So I did it more, and I went hit harder on it. I, I had all these ways to describe things, and I had analogies and all this and that. And analogies can be helpful, but um, intricate ways of describing how the hip moves in 
a coordination with a reverse punch or something. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, that, that is not good instruction. That is me jerking myself off a little bit in front of the class. Oh, no, I, 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 see, I, see that, I use that same phrase, man. It's like, you know, <laughs> you're, just, you're just showing off at this point. The, uh, the polite way I put it when I'm in polite company <laughs> is self-aggrandizement. But sure. um, <laughs> yeah. I'm not I'm not that polite. So you have no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm among that. friends here. So, uh, but yeah, self-aggrandizement. Without that's out. That's absolutely that. But so you mentioned, and this is what's something that's really interesting to me. So is the way that you talk about training, especially with your your students. You mentioned chest to chest alignment and chest to chest coverage. Um, so you have a you have a particular way that you talk about the positions in jujitsu and wrestling. Um, so how, what is that? I, I, I want to call it a taxonomy. How does that taxonomy work? And why did you decide to change the way you talk about jujitsu to this sort of idiosyncratic way? Okay. So the main reason we, we want to do it is we, the, people talk about jujitsu in moves, but you realize that moves are just moments where a bunch of skills come together for a specific effect. Mm-hmm. And then, so actually the, I, I'm going to see if I can articulate this because it started, the path to this started a long time ago. I remember thinking this one thing back when I was a purple belt watching class. I remember I was teaching, I was, you know, teaching at my old school when I was, when I was trained with Lloyd. And uh, we would show moves, of course. And I was always like you, very, I was trying to be articulate. I was trying to describe every movement the best I could, no waste, like really get these guys doing what I thought would be, be, be right. And I noticed, how do I have this thing? How do I teach the middle? I remember I could show you the, the movement pattern, but I knew inside that it didn't exactly happen like that. I mean, that was. Yeah goal was, but it really wasn't. There was some middle stuff that I couldn't describe. And I was like, man, something is here that, how do I get them to see it this way? I remember that was actually the first thing that, that triggered in my mind like years back in like 2007. And then that was always with me. And then what I realized is the move we were showing is the moment, but the stuff in between is the, uh, are the situational effects. Effects that we are having over the other person's body that allow for these movements to occur. So I started developing our language around the bodily alignments that were taking place based on the effect they were having on the opponent's body. So we try to look at the opponent as the environment itself and our actions are affecting it. So mm-hmm. rather than talk about our actions specifically, we talk about our general alignments and how those general alignments are targeted toward a specific task goal and, and what effect that we're trying to produce. So for example, if we're talking about chest to chest contact, we're talking about our largest service area covering their largest service area, right? So that, that's the physical alignment. That's the situation that allows us to occur. And what we say is that we can apply the most amount of body weight to a large service area from a large service area. So as we work, we are trying to hold our partner underneath our chest. So when we, when we look down, if we see our partner under our chest, then we know the alignment is going to produce the most force or the most weight application, quote, possible, right? Like, and again, I'm, I'm using these strong, absolute words, but only to describe um, or, or why I'm using that language. But yeah, so, I mean, absolute's not really real. We don't know what absolute means. It's like just enough, right? <laughs> How much pressure needs to be uh, uh, utilized to achieve the goal. But anyway, yeah, I, I just, I, I use the effect that the alignments have on the body to help uh, dictate the, or to create the language uh, that we use to describe it. One of the things that struck me about the language immediately <coughs> is that it is, it vastly simplifies the landscape of jujitsu. Yeah, because there's not much actually happening. Like there's many different ways a simple thing can happen, but it's really just a few simple things. It's always a top player versus bottom player, right? It's mm-hmm. always a top player trying to pass bottom player's legs, trying to pin them to the mat, chest to chest, chest to back. And to isolate the limbs or expose the neck. Like it's always the same thing. The bottom player is always doing the same thing too. They're always trying to keep their arms and legs in front of their opponent to make strong, meaningful connection, to manage distance, to destabilize the body, to become the top player or get behind it or uh, initiate uh, attack on the periphery, neck, arm, legs. Mm -hmm. And it never changes. It just always, it repeats over and over and over again. And then we realize there's like this, this, this uh, system of, of uh, physical hierarchy, like these alignments that are going to appear more often than others based on the strength of their physical alignment relative to the task being performed. And so we try to keep our language solely around those, you know, uh, uh, you know highly featured exchanges. I mean, <clears throat> and uh, um, the physical effects it's having in each, in each of the situations. Yeah. Um, 
Do you do you also do you also teach striking? No, no, no. You don't have any, any strikers. Okay. I mean, I have a, I have two strike. I have two days a week. We have a boxing coach come in, but I literally have nothing to do with that class. I don't even watch it. Okay. Uh, we basically just keep in the gym because some people there's a you know you have our gym is kind of split down the middle. We have uh-huh. the guys who are very serious about their training and who are training four days a week plus. And we have our special core group who trains every day, but that's just that, that, that there's something different. And then we have the guys who come in just to have some fun. You know, they want to, they want to do a little striking. They want to do a little grappling. <clears throat> so we have that there to help break up the monotony, but we don't, mm-hmm. I don't teach it. Yeah. I, I, I ask because I'm interested to see how that approach to talking about training would work in a striking context. Cause I think there's definitely some things you can talk about, like, um, for like my background's in sport, sport taekwondo. So, um, like talking about, um, scoring in terms of, are you scoring with the top of the foot or the bottom of the foot? And are you in a position where both of you are in opposite types of stances or stances where the chests are facing in different direction? You know, we call that open and close stance, right? Like okay. the, both of those entail different movements in how to, to enter and score. Instead of talking about hook kick, back sure. kick, round kick, you know, <laughs> axe kick, right? Um, sure. So I, I'm interested. I would be interested to see that, and even from a punching perspective, how that would change uh, the way that you coach. Which I am interested. Can you talk about how this the, this way of speaking about the positions in jujitsu? How does that change the way that you coach your athletes, um, either? before they start rolling or during rolling or whenever you give your feedback, whatever your cadence sure. is. We have a bunch of different ways that we do this based on what or what level, f- uh, how they're perceiving their environment. So let's say they're very new and we're teaching something general. Like we want to teach the difference between a staggered stance and a square stance. Mm-hmm. So there are certain invariant features of a square stance that make the body weak to certain engagements. So a square stance is very easily destabilized forward and backwards. So if I'm the bottom, let's say I'm going to use the bottom, the bottom position, and I want to work on my basic destabilization tactics from my guard, right? And I'm dealing with a square opponent. We help our students understand that a square stance is vulnerable to push and pull. Very, very vulnerable. So if you can perceive squareness, push or pull. doesn't matter what you start with because the body's always going to react to the first thing you do to it, or it's going to have that initial effect. We don't know. We cannot predict it. We have to start prospecting. Right. Yeah, we got to put some action in the environment and see what the hell is going to happen. Yeah. <clears throat> Basically, when we perceive squareness, we push or pull it. So we'll play a game where that's what we do. Our, our, we call it chasing squareness. So it's the idea is as we engage in the grip fight for the purpose of ma- ma- making and maintaining connection for the purpose of controlling distance, mm-hmm. We try to use the push and pull mechanism to generate squareness. And once we see squareness, we chase it in a direction. We use that connection to either pull our opponent towards their hands to you know, uh, help manipulate the square position. Or if we feel resistance on the pull, we push them backwards to destabilize squareness to the butt. And this would be a way that we help the students understand why squareness is vulnerable. And we help them go through their own search, come up with actions that um, take that into account. So they learn how to feel it for themselves rather than just memorize it. So we don't give them moves from it. We just tell them to engage with it. Now, sometimes if I want a specific action to emerge, I'll basically tell them what I, like that someone wants to do. I'm like, all right, uh, in a square position, it's more, you can more easily destabilize someone backwards if you can hold both of their feet still. Mm. So sometimes we'll start an, engage, an engagement where the bottom player will have four points of contact on the top player in a square stance and we'll tell them to try to push them to their butt so they can feel that. And then we'll start them in a, non, a non-connected position and have them try to achieve that. So again, we just keep exploring that situation through different starting points, uh, you know, different task goals. But the idea is the same thing. Square is vulnerable to push and pull. Can you perceive it? And can you act upon it once you perceive it? I don't Excellent. know if that answers No, no, no. I, I, I really like that. I think <laughs> people that listen to my podcast are at varying levels of of where they are with ecological dynamics. And some people are just looking for something different because they feel or intuit that what they've been doing most of their life is not, there's something missing or it's not as effective or there's, there's that disconnect, right? Where you're talking about as a purple belt, looking at how you instruct versus knowing that there are big chasms of gaps between instruction and the actual skilled performance of, of a movement. Um, so I think some people are going to have a hard time conceptualizing 
what it means to look for an, an alignment or okay. well, I a can perception. Have a, I have a perfect argument for these people that I sure. use with my students too. So the first is something I just call, what we were calling historical emergence. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand that the first two people that ever engage in any given activity, like a task focused game, like let's say two guys are hanging out like, man, I wonder if I can throw you down to the ground. And they're like, <laughs> yeah, try it. And they start, right? Mm -hmm. There's going to be something that emerges uh, that's going to allow one person to have success over the other. And it's not going to be based on instruction. It's going to be one person trying to accomplish the task and figuring it out. And if, if it happens, they're probably going to try it again. And if it's highly successful, they're going to keep going after it, right? And if no resistance they receive from the person they're playing with is ever great enough, then it's probably going to spread. You know, if other people join in the game and they're going to see that guy do that thing that he just did, they're going to maybe try to copy it. But again, it wasn't instruction that happened first. It was, and I, it was a, a concept based on a task, right? So I want to perform this task. Well, what's the goal? Well, I'm going to try to throw you down on the ground. Okay, let's go. You know, and then something emerges. So that historically, mm -hmm. the thing happens before instruction is given. Right. So if we know that, then why the hell are we do it any differently? Like, right. if, it, if it does that on its own. So what, what I tell people like this is, you're not coming here to remember what I've learned. You're coming to be given the opportunity to be aligned in the situation from which I learned it. So if my skill emerged because I was in this alignment, then you're going to start here in this alignment and see if you can get it to emerge too. Mm -hmm. And here's your opportunity to learn it for yourself like I did. So I might have had to do 47 different variations to come up with this for the first time. But since I now know how uh, this emerges, I can just start you in the alignment that I originally had success. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I can just start you where I am. You know what I mean? Yeah. And this requires almost no explanation. <clears throat> and the second thing is this. We, you could drill a movement 4,000 times in a row with no resistance. Mm -hmm. But the first time you achieve resistance, you're going to fail. However, it's not the case that sometimes when you try for the first time, you fail. Sometimes without ever drilling something, if someone gives you a task, sometimes you perform it the first time. So if we know that occasionally, the first time somebody tries something, their success, but drilling something 4,000 times often still feels the same as trying it for the first time, why would we waste that first 4, 000, those first 4,000 moments? Absolutely. So these are arguments that I try to use to help prime the mind and defeat that initial expectation. Right. It's... Um, mm -hmm. It's like the a Cain and Abel situation. Like, how did they how did they settle their disputes before Cain decided to bust open Abel's head with a rock? <laughs> hopefully, they started uh, just talking. But hopefully, they started out talking and maybe wrestling before Cain decided to be a murderer. But but that's this basically it, yeah. Like, how did it how did it happen the first time or the first few times? Like, uh, you know, you figured it out in the moment. Based on the const based on the the information and based on the feeling and the constraints of that engagement, you, but we we have this idea of oh we have to step back and we have to add all this additional layer of verbal explanation, and then we have to isolate everything and go through every single movement, and you know people eventually will sometimes be able to to execute some of those movements, but they break easy. They're not adaptable. Oh, oh, for sure. Because again, you're trying to follow up. You're trying to use your memory. You're not trying to use your right. real, whatever your real time memory is called. Again, I'm not, I, I know nothing about uh, that, that type of language or that type of world. I'm, I don't, I'm not into neuroscience that much, just like the yeah. you know, uh, psychological approach. But either way, like, I mean, if, if we know it works one way by direct engagement, why would we not do it that way? I mean, I, I, I just, I can't. I, I can't. I, I used to be an IP guy too. I was like right. all in there's Erickson, and I I drilled my face off, and I was doing <laughs> perfect practice, deliberate practice. You know, I did all that, and it was like, man, I just was not receiving the results that I wanted. And the second I stopped doing it, and I just started to play in the environment and let the things that emerged came out, and I tried to repeat them based on my you know my discovery of them. And man, it just I, I changed. I, it, it became like a much more interesting and fluid way, way, way to, to do the, the procedure. So I'm just, I don't, I don't know how people are still stuck on the other thing. I'm just not sure. I mean, yeah. They, well, I, I heard this one thing one time. I was listening to a talk. The, the guy said that the intellect is fluid. Uh, so what, what kind of happens is when we hear something that sounds good, it gives the brain this tingle like we know it too. Mm -hmm. Real knowledge isn't memory. It's, you know, it's you understanding it for yourself. Uh, whatever the difference there is, I don't know, but... Um, yeah, there's declarative memory. There's procedural memory. Procedural memory is with is um, remembering to move a certain way, mm. um, and there's a remembering going on when you 
when you come in contact with the same information or the same problem, like repetition without repetition, <coughs> there's a remembering going on, but it doesn't dict, it doesn't govern your movement in the moment. It just creates a, a stronger attraction to a particular alignment. Yeah. And what's interesting is me and my, my black belt, DeAndre Corbe, who's the guy who I've been experimenting on the, the most heavily. So he came to me as a black belt and this guy was like, uh, his jiu-jitsu was not complete. Like I, I was surprised how, because he was, I knew he was good, but then when he came into our room, he wasn't good. And I was so shocked. I was like, man, this guy, it's like a high level dude. Uh, but anyway, I, he's been working with me the closest. Like this guy moved down, he, he moved from Virginia beach to, to our place and been working with me. And, uh, you know, he's, he's fully bought into this ecological approach so much so that he doesn't even remember what he did before. Like, it's crazy. We talk about, <laughs> but anyway, like he's, he's my guy. He's the, he's the guy I'm trying to use to say like, Hey, even if you have previous training, even if you have a lifelong uh, attachment to the IP and all this other stuff, you can change your perspective and, and you can enhance your skills. Anyway, that's kind of something that we're doing on our side of things. But he says that he, we would talk about this process, this memory. We agreed. It feels more like forgetting. So <laughs> yeah. This, uh, the, the process of actually bringing knowledge in and changing your behavior and making it more fluid and, and, and adaptable to the environment, it doesn't feel like memory. It literally feels like forgetting. So memorization feels like, oh, I have to stop for a moment and think, right? Uh, whereas when you're in the live environment, you're making choices based on what's happening in real time. It doesn't feel like memory. It feels like right. you don't understand how you just did it. Right. And you can only look at it afterwards. So after we sit down and we're theory crafting about what just happened or what we could have done better, it's only then that we recall. It's just right. it's an interesting feeling. Yeah. 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 And it, there is, there is an interplay with thinking about your training afterwards and helping that consolidate learning. But again, it doesn't control the behavior. Um, cause every time you get into this, 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 uh, loop about indirect, <coughs> um, control of your movement, for sure. mental models and all this, this garbage, um, People are like, well, what about thinking about it afterwards? And that, that, that seems to enhance learning. Yes, it does enhance learning, but that's not what learning is. Learning is not motor control. Motor learning is, uh, is, is occluding all of the <laughs> things that don't work and then going to alignments and attuning your perception to what you need to be focused on. It's not about running programs that are pre-built of how to uh, deal with every single possible situation. Um, that you can conceive of. Yeah, because I, I, I think people don't realize the difference between like things they're thinking about and paying attention. Like, right. like, yeah. Things. yeah. Like paying attention is being open and, and allowing information to come in as, as it is. You're not living in your head. You're living out well, with what's in front of you. Absolutely, yeah. That, and that's the different thing. And I, I, I try to tell my students that I think the most, the two strongest factors for learning to occur is intention. <laughs> it's having an idea of what you're trying to accomplish. And two, your focus of attention, where you're putting your energy. Like where, where are you putting your eyes? Where are you putting your hands? For what purpose? If, if you know that, that's all you really need to know. Learning will occur. Like it, it, you don't have to like, like jam it in the brain. It, it, it's happening. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. we, we have this, uh, this weird ego about our consciousness. Like if I think about it the whole time, it's going to learn better. That, that's, that's not there. It's, it's nonlinear because we don't know the input output ratio. We yes. just know that if you're engaged, you have your intention and you know how to focus your attention on the task that's in front of you, learning will occur. Um, and so that's really the, what I try to teach my guys is the foundation for it. It's not so much this um, you know, indirect perception, this indirect memory or this thing that you have to have stored in your head, this motor program. And yep. Really, it's not that. And the good thing is that now we're so far beyond having to explain ourselves to the students. I mean, the new guys coming in, yeah, but the, the people who've been there, they get it now. Like right. they, they, Other local guys come in higher belts. I talk on Scott's podcast and my, you know, two-year students are, are literally just working. These guys have been training for 15, 16 years. Like they don't even believe it. That's why they're coming to our gym. So. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm interested to know, because there's always this push and pull every time you come up, you'll make a little bit of, you'll, you'll be talking to somebody, be kind of good up front. You'll make a little headway and then you'll talk about facilitating learning instead of doing something like direct instruction. And then it'll just blow everything to hell. Right. And then now they're like, Oh, you can't, you got to teach them. You got to, you got to go through the steps and everything. So how do you facilitate the learning of an arm lock? How much of it emerges on its own and how much of it is something that you're. So it doesn't on. emerge on its own. It's, it's got to be guided. So yeah. this is what I talk about the invariance of the, the global and local invariance. So there are local invariants of controlling an arm that can, that, that don't change. I don't care if you're 
260 pounds and 70 years old, or you're 115 pounds and you're a 13 year old female. It's the same, right? Mm -hmm. Now the, the, the angles we use, the force applications, the, the alignments can, can have tons of variation within them, but the invariants that guide the breaking of an arm are never change. And so what we do is we just, the only thing that we do to help our students learn is we play with uh, the amount of variation. Right. So if I'm dealing with an advanced student, we allow for as much variation as the, the new student can mentally handle. Mm -hmm. For the inner student, we constrain it down to the most invariant of the alignments that you can think about, where the decision that have to be made are so small that they don't really have to know anything. And so, for example, if I want to teach an arm lock, I will literally put the student in the breaking, we call it the breaking position. The breaking position is when the, the alignment has been completely had that allows us to put a, one of the arms into a state of extension over a fulcrum or one of our hip corners. And so what we do is we, we get them in this position and we tell them, okay, uh, now you're going to, we'll use any one of your arms to hold onto theirs. So we're going to have, we're going to start with one of your arms holding onto theirs and you're going to have one leg that's on their head and one leg that's under their armpit. Okay. We line them up. We say, okay, your job, you only have two jobs right now. Okay. So you have your global job, which never changes. You need to stay on top and you need to hold your partner down. Your local job is to Stay attached to that arm. I don't care what you do, how you move your body, how you move your other limbs. You keep that, that arm glued to your chest. So that's the external focus. Keep it glued to your chest, right? And then the second local job here is to use your legs to hold your partner on the ground. I want you to hold your partner to the floor. And then we say go. And so they get to experience what it's like to hold somebody in that breaking alignment under resistance. That's learning. They're learning how to co coordinate the pressures of their legs, the angles of their body, their balances, how they're associating extension with contraction. Like th they're learning. They're learning how to yeah. take, you know, in real time. They don't know they're learning it because they're just performing a task, but the body will start self organizing around that task. Mm -hmm. And once that's done over days, weeks, and months, a skill will start to emerge. They start to, you know, like we talked earlier, you know, develop the perception action coupling and then something emerges from it, right? Now, uh, we only guide it to the degree that the invariants aren't being followed. So for example, if one of the students keeps, we, we notice that we're people in the room. Sometimes it's, it's a room thing. Sometimes in the room, everyone would, would just be doing the weirdly, the most wrong thing. I'm like what? Uh, but and sometimes it'll be a single person. Like I say, they just uncovered the head. Well, then we'll give them what we call an invariant rule. Okay. This is something that never changes. We don't uncover the head. If we want to hold the body down, we can't uncover the head. And if someone needs an explanation on why we give them a physical explanation. So, okay, so we say the spine is a lever to the hips. The head is the end of it. If the head is free, the, uh, the hips can move. If the hips can move, the body can move. So we exhibit the greatest level of control over the hips starting at the head. And so that just gives them a, a nice reason to be holding the head down. Mm. Sometimes that can inform where they put their attention. It does, it's not something to be memorized. It just informs their attention. Yep. So now they're going to be heavily focused on trying to perform the task based on what they would think would be the optimized skeletal structure. And not that, and I'm only, I'm using optimization loosely. I'm just, I just know, we know that the lever is most effectively manipulated at the end of it. So if we know the head's the end of it, then we can in some way, you know, put enough pressure on the head to try to maximize our holding pressure. Right. That's how we start teaching arm locks. We put them in the alignment, we give them the task, we have them play go. And we separate them into like games. So that first one would be a control game. Our only job is to keep the arm and hold the body down. So that's enough. That's a lot to do for a brand new person walking in off the street. And then <clears throat> we give them a little break and then we have them play again. We say, okay, now when you're holding them down, we want you to put the arm into a state of extension and we want you to try to pull it over one of your hip corners. So I want you to pull it and keep it as tight as you can until your partner taps out. And then that's the game. And so they, within one day, within about six to 12 minutes of engagement, they've learned how to arm lock or mm. they, they're engaging and learning how to arm lock. Right. So... That's a great segue. I, I want to understand how your class structure works. You said you said in a previous conversation that you have a foundations class and then you have like a class that's just mostly um, like 10 minute sessions of rolling. How do those how do you go from foundations to the, um, the other class? What's the, <coughs> the, the logic of the, that sort of two class structure? Um, and what are the difference between the two classes? Okay, so for the average person, you only you can only choose between one or two classes. You have mm -hmm. foundations, which is where everyone starts, and then you have all levels. Now, all levels is we, we tell everyone who wants to join that class. There's a small assumption of knowledge, and the variation increases. So the things that you have to basically understand the basic game of jujitsu to go to that class. So you have to mm -hmm. understand top bottom positioning in general. You have to understand 
you know, guard passing, sweeping, submitting, and back taking in general. Like you have to just know what those terms are. If you know what those terms are, man, jump into that class, you know? And we allow students to, to get into those classes as fast as they want. So if they've been training for, let's say a month and like, man, I love foundations coach, but I need more. Bang, get in there. You know, do as much as your brain can handle, as much as your body can recover from. It's open to you. So anyway, the only difference between the foundations and the all levels is the length of time of training and the variations imposed on the student. Mm -hmm. So once they go from the foundations class to the all levels, the rounds change in time. They go from three minute exchanges to six minute exchanges. Okay. So we just increase the time. So the physical uh, responsibility of the partner to try to get through the hour is going to be much higher. Okay. Um, and then that, that's where you cap out. And so that's most people, they're, they're never going to go beyond that. And then now I have the competition team. Now this mm. has a standard. If you train less than four days a week, competition's not for you. And we tell everyone that it's not for you. It's okay. Have fun with your friends, do the six, do the seven competition's not for you. But if you're training four days a week plus, you, they come talk to me and I pull them up into the comp class. And that's when they start getting introdu introduced to these 10 minute rounds. And now we tell them there's nothing special about the 10 minutes. We just want to make sure that you have plenty of time to work within the space to start to problem solve and explore and, and try new movement solutions. We want to give you time. We don't want the urgency to be so high or a low time, which will increase the urgency, that you're mm -hmm. focused so much on the physical engagement as it is uh, with energy output. We want you to be able to focus on, on the physics of why things are happening, the alignments you're choosing, the decisions you're making. We want you to be able to be in, you know, get out there and explore. So that's why we do the longer rounds, but they are more taxing physically and mentally. So that's why we wait for a student to be more experienced before we, we pull them up. And we also want to make sure they can handle a four day plus week training, training volume. That's not for everybody. So absolutely. I remember that we had talked before, you were talking about moderating intensity by increasing the length of um, the practice. And not only does that help people stop being a spaz, it also helps them to be, be more technical, as it were, to slow down sure. and uh, explore more. I don't think of technical as being perfect technique, but uh, yeah. as exploring. Yeah, how uh, that's you're making that's how I think of it. Yeah, we, we, t t when we think of something technical as being like using uh, efficient alignments to accomplish tasks. So we, we tell people that our right and wrong measure is a scale. Mm -hmm. the, the initial right is only effective. But effective could mean you just did your, you know, 105% of your one rep max on that arm lock. You know what I mean? I mean, that's effective, but man, that, that's not, that's not technical, you know? So technical is once you're effective, learning how to create alignments and use energy outputs that increase your consistency and can help you perform it in a more timely manner, that translates to more efficient. So once something becomes effective, the more efficient it becomes, the more right it becomes. Mm -hmm. So the more often you can do it, the less energy you use and the more quickly it can be done, you're, you're transitioning into technical at that point or more efficient. So we let them know that it's a sliding scale. It's not really a black and white thing. Awesome. Um, so how do you decide, how do you approach designing the different exercises that you have them do um, and, and lining up those throughout a session? Is part of it in the moment? Is What is the interplay between... Si pre-session pre designing and then how you adapt to the session within the session. All right. So there's a bunch of stuff here. That's a lot. So, uh, okay. Yeah. So first, let's start with the, the most simple global way that we do it. It's really amount of variation within a practice. So said, mm -hmm. the newer the player, less variation. Now it's not blocked, but the, the variation is just lower. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, the more advanced, higher amounts of variation. So mm -hmm. we start with positional alignments that have low variation. And then we work our way backwards out towards neutrality. So we know that the most, the, the, the most mentally taxing the, uh, way to engage is at the start of a fight. Starting on your feet, shaking hands, go. Because there's no alignment yet to be had. You have to create them all. So again, it's the most variable situation you can be in. So again, we start with the least and we start to work our way back out towards neutrality. So for the basic class, we don't ever start in a non-connected position. Starting in non-connected positions are very... Uh, mentally taxing for a new player. They don't know how to start the engagement. And now what I say is non-connected. I, I would mean like they don't start standing, shake hands, go in the foundations class. They just right. don't. Yeah. Uh, they play the whole game, but they do it from stereotypical positions like the half guard, the open guard, the closed guard, mouse, right. eye control. You know what I mean? Right. But anyway, okay, we start to be in a class, low variation, like in starting in the arm lock breaking position. We do little three-minute exchanges and they are more intense. And the reason we do your shorter rounds for beginners, it's as intense for them anyway. They're using so much energy because they don't know the alignment that it's, it's, it's three minutes for them is like death. 
you should see some of these guys like halfway through class. Yeah. You only work for 18 minutes. Calm down, you know? But for yeah. them, it's like that. Yeah. So anyway, uh, so we do a three-minute exchange based on like a low, low variation. And then we start to work our way back out. And so like, let's say arm lock specific. We would go from the breaking aspect to what we could call the control aspect. The control aspect is that moment that you can't break, but you have control of the arm. And then we would add a transition there. Like, for example, we'd start them at the line of the shoulders and we'd have them play a game where they would have to cover the head with their, their head leg and get into the breaking position. So they get mm-hmm. to start with the arm fully locked in and wedged in place, but they have to be able to perform the action of covering the head, sitting back and achieving the breaking position. And then that would be, you know, a few minutes, a few exchanges at a few, a three minutes. And then we work our way back out towards the mount. And now and at this point, I would give them what we call precursors. So precursors are alignments that have to happen before control can be had before a transition to breaking can be had. So uh, a precursor for arm locks, for example, is putting an arm into a state of extension. So we'd start them in the mount and we'd play a game where they would start to learn how to put the arm in a state of extension. And so all we would do is say, okay, top player, your job is to use your arms to take one of your opponent's arms and glue it to their head. If you can glue it to their head and keep it stuck, you win the game. And so anyway, so we go from low variation to higher amounts of variation, going from basically a break, working our way back out, as close to neutrality as possible. So mm-hmm. I design my our games for the day or the week or the month based on that. That's based on that thing. So that's going to be our global way we we create practice. Now, the second thing I take into consideration for beginners, the second way I design uh, the program is based on playing the whole game of jujitsu every single day. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by the whole game is there's always a control component and, and, a, and a relatively neutral component. So. I used to do it where I would have like these monthly lessons. So now I'm switching it. I'm going pin neutral, pin neutral, pin neutral every week. So uh, one week we're working on an aspect of a pin. Let's say for example, mount. Okay. The whole week we're doing different things. We're learning how to arm lock from the mount. We're learning how to head and arm strangle from the mount. We're learning how to control the mount. We're learning how to create states of extension and contraction and back exposure from the mount. This would be just different things we would work on. Or we work the bottom position. We work, we learn how to frame, manage distance, um, you know, recover our guard, reverse the position, things like that. Uh, and then the next week we would work neutrality. Let's say we, we would work something that linked to that. We would work to chest to chest half guard. It would teach the top player how to pass into side control, how to pass into mount. We talk about pinning the body, staying on top, freeing the trapped leg, putting the arm into a state of extension as a precursor to freeing the trapped leg, anything from new, than the half guard. And then the next week we'd go, we do it. We just do another pin. We'd go to side control and we learn how to put our arms in isolation, uh, contraction, extension, expose the back. And then the next week we go back to a pin. We do close guard and we learn how to open, you know what I mean? So you're yeah. playing the whole game all the time. You're always starting in front of the legs, top or bottom, passing the legs on top, keeping the legs in front on bottom, controlling a pin, working to a submission every single week. We don't, every single day. So we just, that's the second way. We play jiu-jitsu, the whole game of jiu-jitsu every single day. And so that, that's for, those are the two uh, basically main practice designs for, or excuse me, uh, way as I, I guide a practice design for the foundations class. Um, and the, the only last, the last thing that I use uh, is I teach to the room. I really make sure that these lessons are actually having an effect and people are engaging. If people are not engaging in the way that I set out the lesson, I'll make small changes. Okay. But, yeah, awesome. Yeah. So you started, so basically when you started going the pin, pin, then the um, con- control pin, I'm sorry, pin, full game pin. Is that how it works? Oh, no, so, no, pin, neutral, pin, neutral, pin, neutral. Pin so guard, neutral. guards are neutral generally. So like okay, yeah. the only the only non-neutral guard is chest to chest half guard. But either way, uh, like uh, belly up open guard, seated open guard, closed guard, half guard. These are considered neutral because nobody really has control in the game of jiu-jitsu. Because when it, with yeah. a guard present, the bottom player can still fight effectively. So that's why we call it neutral. Pin and neutral. So you basically, you kind of move to kind <clears throat> of like an interleaved structure to how going back and forth between... The, the broad ways that you've decided to well, because understand the game. Those are the only two positions that are ever happening. So we're either fighting from within a guard, top or bottom, mm-hmm. or fighting past the guard, top or bottom. Like there, there's literally nothing else. Like, there, like there's nothing else. So yeah. the only way the bottom player can fight effectively is with their guard present. And if their guard's not present, they have to get it back or try to get on top. Yeah, absolutely. The only way the top player can do anything to the bottom player is they pass the legs. And so once they pass the legs, they have to stay on top and hold the partner down and so and not get turned over. And yeah. so each player is always playing their responsibility every day, every week. The bottom player in some aspect is always trying not to get submitted, always trying to uh, put the top player back in front of their legs or reverse the position. 
Or once the legs are in front, they're trying to control, make and maintain connection for the purpose of controlling distance or destabilizing, right? So that's always happening. The top player is always trying to do their same things. Stay on top, hold your partner down, pass the legs, make the body vulnerable to submission. And it's like over and over and over again. And all the alignments in which this basic meta occurs as we just make sure that they're always playing that meta. Absolutely. Something that I really appreciate the, about the way that you have conceptualized and that you speak about jujitsu is that you've taken, so there's terms, there's ecological terms, all kinds of like egghead terms for everything that you're talking about, but you have boiled everything accurately down to variant and invariant. It It is a useful way of describing every scale of analysis of the way that you talk about um, movements, practice design, like everything that you need to, you have boiled down to variant and invariant. And I think this is why it's so important for researchers to be talking to people like you who just spend most of your time teaching um, because the way you talk about it makes it super simple to understand. And, 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 it, and it makes it easier to get through the cloud that terminology can create in your mind of understanding things. So you don't have to talk about stochastic resonance. You don't have to talk about interleaved structures, micro structures and macro structures and meso structures of practice and everything. Those are useful so that people know exactly what you're talking about in a research paper. Those are not useful for talking to coaches on how to understand how to make their practices better. Well, what's the difference between two coaches talking and a coach student talking? It's different things. So mm-hmm. when researchers are literally trying to you know, tear the fabric of reality and try to figure out what the hell's going on. So mm-hmm. they need to split these hairs because in right. their game of, you know, discovery, they're trying to challenge each other by strengthening the the way they're defining the world through however they're achieving this objective reality or however they're perceiving this objective reality. And that's their game, right? So you guys are going nuts trying to get this language so that you know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Well, my job is just to let what you guys are fighting about inform me about how to do my job. But I don't need to do your job. I have to teach people jujitsu. So I have to learn how to take all that jargon and mm-hmm. just apply it. And it's really just the application process. So uh, anyway, so yeah, so that, that's, uh, that's all I focus on. Like I, I joke, I, I, I tell my students, I force gumped it. It's like, you know, <laughs> uh, why'd you put that weapon together so fast, private gum? It's because you told me to drill sergeant, right? So like if Rob Gray says that the only thing that a practice needs, or I think, I'm sorry, I, I learned this from Rob Gray, but I think it was Carl Newell. He said that if to, to coach do the practice well, they have to only do two things. They have to teach what's invariant, and then they have to leave room for uh, self-expression. And so I took that seriously. I'm like, all right, if that's to be true, and if ecology is true all the time, how do I talk about it in jiu-jitsu? What I need to know uh, as a coach. And that's it. I just distill it down. And this is an activity I like to do anyway. I really like to strip things down. Like anytime I'm doing these like little mental games or I'm, I'm doing these little like a thought experiments on about jujitsu or about coaching, I just take away everything that's unnecessary. And I just use whatever I'm left with. You mm-hmm. know, I, this is, I try, and I try to refine this all the time and I never stop it. I always sit around with my other, other black belts. We bullshit. We sit there and we theory craft and we joke and we talk about physics and we talk about how could, how could, how could we use this word to better describe, like, for example, we don't even want to use arm lock anymore, right? Mm. Uh, we, we just want to use straight lock, twisting lock. We don't even want to talk about like, cause what does an arm lock mean? Which direction do you mean? Do you mean yeah. down, out? What do you mean? So we're, we're, just, we're even trying to distill that. Mm. So anyway, we, we just try to, we like to strip things down. Yeah. <clears throat> so I know there's going to be some piss ant that says, well, what about, you can't do this with leg locks. Yes, leg locks are just too, too dangerous. So how do you, I mean, you've really addressed this already, but for the actually nerd um, listening to this that thinks that you can't do this with leg locks because their hobby horse is always different and whatever you're talking about never applies to that. Um, how do you manage leg locks? How do you, how do you, cause yes, they can be dangerous. Heel hooks can, can, can cripple you or whatever, but so how do you manage that? Okay, so first, we, we always tell our students, we're playing a dangerous game. So we have to respect each other in this room. When we are submitting each other, our win over our opponent is not more important than going to work tomorrow. And so that's mm. just, culturally, we set that out. Yeah, Hell yeah we're going we're gonna to go after it. We're going to work hard and we're going to try to put on true breaking pressure. But we're not going to do it at tournament pace, like at all. We're going to use tournament pressure 
but we're not going to do it at tournament pace. And then we kind of, we define that. I'm just using that language now, but we, we, we help them understand what that means. Uh, and we, 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 we have a culture of trust. You know, we, we try to combine that hard driving competitive spirit with the communality of we're all here together trying to achieve this goal, no matter you know what it is. So anyway, so first we set the culture. And the next we have the students realize that the leg lock itself is just an aspect of guard work. So we teach the foundation of entanglement first. So we teach the student that leg entanglements themselves are the guard. It's a different way that we can attach to different aspects of our partner's body, most mm. of the hips to destabilize it. And then we use that connection to Excuse me, manage distance and destabilize the body. Now, in certain alignments, we can attack the leg, right? And so once you get the grip, we always tell the, the per- person the same thing. No hard, strong movements. You bite down as hard as you can and you, you give it slow pressure until your partner taps. And also, too, we don't tap with the hands anymore, okay? So we teach our students that your hands should always be working to defend yourself. They should always be working. So if you get yeah. to the point where you can't take it, you out, we, we verbally tap now. Like in the whole room, you'll hear, tap, tap, tap. Like, so that way, because the voice goes out faster than the hands. Yeah. So as long as your hands are always engaged with your partner, you're not going to receive anything that's devastating. In eight years, we've only had one injury from entanglements and it had nothing to do with what one partner was doing to the other. It literally had to do with the guy who was receiving the entanglement. He was one of our better guys and he was like really resisting something he shouldn't have been resisting. Uh, That was the only injury we've ever had. We've never in eight years, not a single injury. And for example, we like... Uh, we're pretty proficient in leg locks now. We started really heavily uh, training them in 2014. And uh, just recently, DeAndre Corbe just won the uh, ADCC Open yesterday. Uh, he had six matches. He won four of them by uh, leg submission and two on points. Excellent. And he's, uh, yeah, so he won the 70 kilogram uh, division. Yeah, this is, this is the, this is one of the underappreciated <clears throat> aspects of the constraints led approach and the ecological approach is that, it does not make you more injury, injury prone. It makes you exactly the opposite. For sure. I, I had the question of the day. A guy came to me and said, you know, you guys do nothing but live work. How do you prevent injury? I was like, through variation. We just don't do the same thing all the time. Right. Like, yeah. If, if I let you wrench on my arm all week, I'm going to have shoulder and elbow issues. Like, but if, if one day, uh, you know, you're twisting my arm, next day you're straightening it, you know, I'm going to be okay. You know, and the third day you're putting it into extension, you're, you're not going to, it's, it's a different depression on different aspects of the system. So yeah. yeah, people are scared of things for the same reason they've always been. They don't understand them. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, Reddit is poison. Okay. And so <laughs> part of the problem with ours, you know, this whole thing is Reddit. And people, I have guys come in and be like, I've heard that jiu-jitsu has a high rate of injury. Should I train? It's like, dude, you know, the, probably the highest rate of injury in any sport, probably soccer. Those yeah. dude, ankles and knees get wrecked. Yep. No one's scared to play soccer, you know? It's like, there's no such thing as a free lunch, man. Your body's going to get worn out over time. But mm-hmm. if the, the environment's controlled, it won't be catastrophic. Right, right. Absolutely. I, I, I just, I recorded, because um, I'm doing a batch recording for my fourth season of combat learning. And I just recorded for the first time guys from the HEMA sphere. So these guys go at each other with like wooden heavy swords or <laughs> like hard plastic swords and um go at each other and i was like i had a hunch because i've been looking at this research that shows that variability in the constraints that approach is actually better for and this is unintuitive for most people but it's actually better for injury so i said hey oh guys so how is your injury rate in, improved or gotten worse and they're like yeah so training got more live more intense more tactically sophisticated because the guys are becoming more creative Oh, and our injury rate massively dropped. (laughs) The worst thing that happens is people get the fencing mask punched into and they get a waffle iron on their forehead, right? That's like the worst thing that happens to most people. Whereas before, when they were doing all the different drills in the kata, they were getting busted fingers and busted, they're getting their head hit really hard and... It, it, and it, it like, it was just all kinds of, all kinds of stuff. And they chain in sand too, which is very interesting. Um, but yeah. Well, that probably controls force output. So that's pretty good. It's not a solid surface. And it makes sure. So, um, I was reading some, some, or listening to some research the other day and, uh, training on sand is so much variability packed and just concentrated that, um, it makes your, your joints 
stronger. So your knees and your hips and your ankles become more adaptable within a, <clears throat> within a very tight, discrete moment of time, their ability to manage different forces from different directions that it seems to have a lot of therapeutic effect and a lot of prehabilitative effect and, and protecting your joints. I'd imagine there's more motion, right? So yeah. like, it's like all the movement guys that are talking, that are out on YouTube now, they talk about how like, you know, motion is lotion. Like you want to yep. move throughout the day as much as you can. Like the only bad posture is the one you're stuck in kind of thing. They have all these like little, yep. little heuristics to help guide you. But basically the idea is like you move, man. So the more your knees and ankles are moving, the more your hips are moving, the healthier as a human you're going to be. Like we unintentionally, we sit more than we are. We, our bodies are designed to. We should be walking more, squatting more, and just, just moving more in general. So of course, man, like, yeah. And especially on sand, you're always shifting, right? Always shifting. So I can imagine that'd be true. That's, that's cool. That's really yeah. Cool. The wrestling and sumo on sand is a lot of fun too. So it's probably worth you and you jujitsu guys out there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> go, go do beach practices, man. It's not just good for aesthetics. Shit. We fucking live in like a stupid suburban place with nothing to do. All, all we do is jujitsu, man. No, it's funny. Like our injury rate at our gym isn't high at all. Actually, we, we, we actually, we do have a problem. So you know, it'd be a clear, we have a burnout problem because our volume is intensely high. So mm. Uh, but this is something we're doing as a, a personal gym. This isn't a jitsu problem. Like most people can't handle our volume. We get visitors all the time. And they're like, I don't know how you do this. And it's like, well, most of our guys are volume tolerant. And so, so we really focus on the lifestyle. Like we are eating and sleeping and mm -hmm. uh, hydrating as we should. And we keep each other accountable. We talk about it all the time. We, we give each other strategies on how to do this better. But just give an example. Our average. And so we have a core group of about 10 guys, you know, uh, uh, girls and guys that train every single day. Their average uh, round accumulation for seven days is 600 minutes. So wow. yeah, so they're doing roughly around, you know, uh, 600 minutes of um, jujitsu a week. Uh, and it's, that's intense. So of real jujitsu, not, not oh, no, 100 percent live work. This isn't not repping, repping not drills. No. There's not a single drill. I mean, not floor <laughs> shrimps. <laughs> I, I had this student in the cup next couple of years. I'm really excited about this, this kid's name is Noah Schaffner. We, 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 we give each other little nicknames. We call this kid purebred because he's 16 years old. He's never known any other way. He's never known any other way. He's never drilled. He doesn't even know what moves are. And he's, his growth is phenomenal. I, I'm so excited about this kid. So in the next couple of years, you know, hopefully if you pay attention to Jitsu Circuit, you'll see him out there, but uh, he's already had a lot of success. He's only lost three matches uh, in the last year and eight months. He's won like nine tournaments and they're all adult tournaments too. So um, the kid's the kid's unreal. And there's nothing special about him. He's not a wrestler. He didn't come from an athletic background. Yeah. He was a, a kid who came into the gym and said, hey, I'm going to learn Jitsu, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, he's, he's bit, and the reason, and he's actually a good one because he didn't even go through the foundations program. It was funny because he started the first month and he comes up to me and he's like, uh, Hey coach, I signed up for a competition. I was like, you can't do that. <laughs> standard here. You can't just yeah. sign up and I, he's a young kid. So I'm like, I'm not going to bust his ball. So I'm like, Hey man, fine. You just bought your ticket to the big time. I want to see you in comp team tomorrow. And he's like, yes, sir. And he hasn't left the mat or he hasn't done a foundations class since his first month. And so he's even took the hardest route ever. He got put in with the dogs from the first month and he's thriving, thriving. Yeah. And people don't understand. They're like, how is he doing these transitions? How is he doing these moves? I was like, he doesn't know. <laughs> Nobody knows. <laughs> Mystery, we, we, we know, we know how to make it emerge. But we can't <clears throat> tell you because it's his body. His body knows. Yeah, that's, it, it, that's pretty baller, dude. That's awesome. No, it's great, man. So yeah, I, you know, I, I'm sorry we kind of like bounced around a bit because there's actually a lot I wanted to unpack about your original questions about you know, language and how we're designing programs. Cause there, there's actually, a, we do it in like a, a truly nonlinear way. Like we'll start with a concept or idea and we'll design a three months of practice around it. And then mm. you know, once we find something else, we'll, we'll pick a new physical invariant and then we'll, we'll go after that. And then we just watch them emerge. Right. So uh, one of the things we were using is hip degeneracy. And so it was this idea that uh, the hips are, are the, the power producers of the human body. So if we can access them, then we can reduce power. And so the whole thing where we were chasing the hips around, right? So we played these games where we would disassociate the shoulders from the knees or elbows from the knees. And we would try to, you know, body lock around the hips. And we were doing this everywhere. And so we spent three months literally chasing each other around the room, trying to grab each other's hips, trying to lift the hips, return them to the mat, hold the hips down. And so everyone's control in the room got, got incredible. Like they were pinning everybody. Like nobody could get off their back. Um, and so anyway, I just said, there's, there's lots of cool stuff that we've been doing with the, with this whole approach and, We've had a lot of success with it. It's been great. Yeah, I mean, what? Go ahead and unpack. I don't have any questions left, so if there's anything in particular you want to unpack about about that, 
now now would be the time to do it. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'll babble at you a bit and see what you think about uh, what we're doing and, and how ecological this is. But basically, uh, the foundation is that you know it's a, we're dealing with a seven lever system. We have a spine, two arms, two legs, shoulders, and hips. Mm-hmm. Uh, these levers are only in two states at any given time. They're in extension or contraction. Um, if either the spine, legs, or arm levers are extended or contracted, this allows us certain access to the body, right? So like, for example, in extended states, in front-facing extended states, the chest and hips are, and shoulders are very vulnerable to direct engagement. Um, if the levers are closed, uh, the, the front-facing body is very vulnerable to flanking and back-taking. So if the elbows and knees are closed towards the center line, the back is available. Uh, and so the, we use these, these physical invariants of what makes the body weak relative specific action to help guide uh, what, quote, techniques we're learning or what, what alignments that we're focused on. And so really a lot of our practice uh, outside the global scale, let's say from the top position of staying on top and holding your partner down, is uh, opening and closing levers or extending, uh, creating uh, states of extension and contraction through the hand fight. So we play games where we get in certain alignments, we hand fight, and we try to look for or create extension, look for or create contraction, look for opening and closing levers. And then we try to just manipulate them uh, for specific effects, right? So we'll play a game where uh, as we're passing on top, we always try to keep one of our opponent's arms glued to their head in any way. So in a state of extension, chest to chest, we try to keep the elbow extended towards the head. If we're in a state where we're chest to back, we try to keep the elbow contracted towards the center line or towards the head. And we'll use these basic physical invariants to create practice around. And we'll play games where we're just manipulating the body for those intended effects. Mm. Uh, And that's the interesting part. And that's the beauty is that the, the, that's how the moves emerge. So I could get guys head and arm strangling each other without knowing they're head and arm strangling each other. We just teach the alignment, you know, and uh, it's based on that, that seven lever system and being in states of extension and contraction. Uh, so that's how we sort of uncover the basic tactics and mechanics of what we're doing. Um, and then uh, for strategy, we look at uh, structural hierarchy based on physical certainty. So if we know that the basic game that we're playing is a game of immobilization versus mobilization, which is what I seem to distill it down to, we know that in order to, ma- to maximally break a body, we have to maximally immobilize a body. So the more still a limb or a lever or a body is held, the more damageable it becomes. So then all of our tactics uh, that, uh, that we use to manipulate this physical hierarchy are based on levels of mobility. So the most mobile situation that we can be in is a standing situation. So two players standing is the least effective for breaking (laughs) because uh, there's no mobilization going on. But if I was able to take somebody, put them on their belly and hold them flat to the mat in the state of extension, they're going to be completely vulnerable to whatever I want to do to them. Mm -hmm. So in between those two extreme states, standing and belly up with back exposed, there's all these alignments that have a physical hierarchy based on their ability to produce motion for the bottom player specifically. Uh, And so... Anyway, yeah, it's just a little bit about you know, a little bit about our our, um, our guiding philosophies and how we use the those physical invariants to inform our mechanics, tactics, and strategies for engagement. Yeah, no, that sounds uh, ecologically <laughs> valid, as uh, as Rob would say. That's that sounds that sounds super ecological to me. I mean, you're creating um, scenarios in which people can um, explore ways to control the human body. No, exactly. Toward the end of the main intention of jujitsu, which is pinning and then submitting. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah that, that's like how we feel anyway. Yeah, it's, it's right. great. Like yeah. we we do a lot of um, a lot of time on what we call precursors too. So when we're creating practice, we want to find an invariant feature that allows many things to happen. So making an arm vulnerable. Let's say I'm on the bottom and I want to make the top player's arm vulnerable to something. Mm-hmm. I make it post. So a posted hand affords a lot of potential action on it. It tells us a lot about the state the body's in. And so if the more you can create posting, the more vulnerable you can make a partner's arm, right? To overhooking, underhooking, Kimura gripping. I mean, you name it. You can post that hand. That hand is yours for as long as it's posted. Um, and so we would play a game where we can, we can reliably create these precursors. Uh, for You asked about leg, legs earlier. So for creating reliable entanglements, we, we call this the rising knee. So we start in situations where the top player has double knees down and we try to uh, 
learn how to use the hand fight to create the precursor of the rising knee. So we try to get our partner's legs to step up and we use certain connections and certain levels of destabilization and their resistance to the the destabilization causes their knees to come off the mat. And when they do, we can now entangle that leg. And so what we really focus on is, again, those precursors that are invariant to the thing, to the thing that we're trying to achieve. So the, you know, invariant property of all leg entanglements, for example, would be hip access. If I can get my legs through yours or through inside position and attach to the hip, I have an entanglement. So what creates that for the bottom player? Getting the top player's knees to come off the mat. If I can get your knees to come off the mat, I can start to, and I have inside position. Sorry, I'm assuming inside position. I'm sorry. I have to remember, I'm assuming inside position as well. Mm-hmm. That's my limbs exist inside yours. If I have those two things, inside position, your knees off the mat, I can entangle. And so again, a lot of our games, a lot of our, our task focus are based on, on uh, the precursors or the, or the invariants that allow for these things to happen. And so we don't waste any time on, on highly specific things because those highly specific things are contingent upon the precursor. So imagine this. Imagine if you could be the best leg locker in the world once you've got a heel, but, or, or you could be the best person at making someone's knee come off the mat, which would you be? Mm-hmm. For me, I'd be the best person getting their knee to come off the mat because if I can repeatedly do it, I have more chances to get to your leg and break it. But if I'm a master at the end piece, but I'm not so good at the former, then I'm less effective at what I do. Right. That's a whole, that's a whole. Anyway. Absolutely. There's a, there's kind of a, an order of operations as you will. I don't want to try and like formalize jujitsu, but for sure there, when we talk about like an invariant feature of the system, well, you're, you're creating an, an attractor state to whatever um, submission that you want to do if you can control the body in the right way before you attempt the submission. Correct. And, that, and, that, and that's where our, 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 you know, our, our positional hierarchy or our concept of physical certainty lies, right? So right. we are physically certain that if we can keep our hips close to your hips and I can to keep your hips glued to the floor while keeping your knee trapped in the boundary of my knee line, that I can, and I can access your heel, I can break your knee. Right? We are phys- it's, a, it's a physically certain state because it's happened many times before. So it's not the process by which we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to replicate it, but the greater situation as a whole that allows the process to take place. And so, yeah, so yeah, yeah. So that, yeah, that order of operations, so to speak. It's not, it's not an order of operations based on jujitsu, right? Or, or the, the, the moves in jujitsu. It's an order of operations based on how the body becomes vulnerable to the grappling situations based on the task that we're trying to perform on it, right? So we're trying to break arms. There's only a few alignments that are going to make it weak to break it. Trying to break legs, only a few alignments, right? Uh, but there's tons of variation within those alignments. Absolutely, yeah. It just breaks down to uh, the physics of two bodies trying to do damage to one another with leverage. <laughs> Listen, you should be the average guy to learn it. I mean, it's easy. I, I, yeah, you, you distilled it down in a few minutes. I mean, it's, it, that's how easy it is. I try to convince everyone of this, you know. And really, I try to, I, I try to excite everyone about the idea. It's like. You know, you don't need some jujitsu Jesus out here distilling the knowledge down to you that you have to pay for and give your life away. You can discover this for yourself. You can read, you know, three books on the ecological approach, listen to a bunch of Rob Gray and, you know, put some mats in your garage and go to work. <laughs> yeah, I think that too. That's a hot take, but pe- people don't want to believe that's the case. But I think you can do that too. If you if you have guys that are willing to not try and kill each other and and, and work with each other, you can just put mats down and wrestle a lot and you can that's how it yeah. started that's how yeah. it started <laughs> like i mean i really believe in that you know i mean like a lot of the the people want to talk about you know like uh well and i, I they want to talk about, oh i'm not getting enough information i need someone to teach me i'm like how oh. man it's like i i i when i left my team i had a, i haven't had a coach since 2013 and so all this new modern stuff that's coming out right that and we got on the forefront of it too like we us as a gym i started like I jumped on the leg locks as early as I could. Once I saw them emerging, I'm like, we're doing this. You know, uh, once I started noticing no gi started to become, uh, you know, the more predominant form of grappling, I jumped on it. Like, you know, no one told me to do any of this. I guided it, right? I did all this modern stuff. I started learning wrestling. I started do, putting myself in situations. situation where, man, nobody coached me. So how did, how am I able to do it? Right. So I do the same things my students do. I, I do the practices too. Uh, you know, so it's like, man, if I can do it, you can do it, you know? Yeah. I haven't had a Taekwondo master or coach since, well, reliably since probably 2006. And then 
I had a I had one that I worked for that he used to teach me in like 2012. <laughs> but since then, I have not had a teacher, master slash coach in Taekwondo. In most of the knowledge and all the work I've done in methodology, my teaching, all that kind of stuff, is after that period when I did not have a coach to teach me more about anything. I really felt like once that happened, once that was available to me, once I was able to explore the environment of my own, based on my own experiential knowledge, I started to learn more than I ever had. Yeah. Because I wasn't trying to remember somebody else's philosophy. I wasn't trying right. to remember somebody else's anything. I was trying to discover it for myself. Right. And there was this really freeing part. And I think that's why I, I, I glommed on to that ecological approach so hard is because it gave me this sense of control, I guess, uh, which is odd because it's <laughs> really what it is, but it gave me that feeling, you know, and I liked it. And I was like, man, I, the environment is my teacher, you're right? The task is my teacher. And I'll just, I'll just learn to communicate with it. And, you know, if I, if I pay enough attention, and I know what I'm trying to accomplish. It'll it'll give me the answers, you know. It it'll, it'll directly speak to me, so to, so to speak. Yeah, you got your self determination back. You got your autonomy back, and so that's what that feeling of control was. Oh, I can do what I feel where I feel like my body wants to go, or where I want to explore, rather than having this very ornate structure of how this instructor sees everything being forced. I have to be forced into the shape of this thing rather than trying to go with what seems to be working for me in this, in this moment, instead of being told that what seems to be working for me, what my body wants to do is actually wrong. And I have to do it this, you know, I have to lift my elbow three degrees and I have to do this. And then they have the exact timing of the whatever, even though my shoulder's bad, I have to dive for the, this, uh, uh, you know, whatever from this angle, even though it feels bad, I feel like it's going to fall off, you know, all this ridiculous stuff. You're not allowed to adapt. You're not allowed to, you know, have to do it the way that you're being taught. Yeah, it's like they're taking away all the things that makes it exciting. I, and I just don't, I don't get it. Man. Yeah. And I never will, you know? I mean, there's some, you know, popular guys in our sport that are really teaching nonsense. I mean, absolute nonsense, even, even cultural and psychological nonsense. Like, and this guy, I heard this guy the other day, this popular guy, he was saying how, like, you know, jujitsu is the same for big guys and small guys. No. Oh. Like, <laughs> well, it's not. I mean, like, if you're 240 pounds and you have a ne- negative ape index, right? And you're dealing with another guy who's 240 pounds. You're not going to wrap your arms around their belly, right? So the way that you would with your hands in a given situation or arms relative to the control you're trying to exhibit is going to be different than if you're six foot four and you're skinny, you know what I mean? And you're, you have a plus six ape index. It's going to change the way your body moves and why you perform the movements that you perform and the, the information you're pulling from the environment. It's all going to be different. And it's like, and, and the, the, the problem with that, that cultural view that they're out they're outputting is people start to think like this. So then you'll get a guy in there who maybe be a little overweight, a little less athletic, and he's trying to, you know, bear and bolo or invert underneath some other guy. And then he's like wasting all this time and getting these injuries and feeling bad about himself. When all you said, man, that's not for you. you know? Yeah, just do something <laughs> I mean, else. <laughs> yeah, you could maybe lose a bunch of weight and you won't have that limiting factor of your belly anymore. And maybe it'll work for you, but you know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that martial arts in general, because I hear this a lot, in traditional martial I mean, it's, it's really bad everywhere. Jiu-jitsu has convinced everyone that does jiu-jitsu that they are some sort of intellectual. Oh, and shit. I literally want to kill myself when I hear these people philosophize because it's not real philosophy. They don't read philosophy. They don't do philosophy. So they say this stuff that sounds kind of smart about how, how jiu-jitsu works. It's not informed whatsoever by like an actual motor control for th- learning theory or anything that's like for real. And I'm like, dude, I want to fucking die. I, I want to die right now, dude. I don't want to no listen idea. to this anymore. Sometimes <laughs> I have to put my phone down, man. I have to put it down. I can't look. I can't look. Dude, I stop and, it, put it down. I'm like, dude, I don't want to hear this anymore. It's so bad. You know, the wor- you know, honestly, man, the worst thing for me is, is I'm a black belt in the space who's producing champions. And so I have to listen to this shit. And, yeah. the, and that's the part is I don't, I'm not, I don't, Honestly, I love talking to you guys because this is the only way I can get it out. Like, I don't really have a stake in the community. I don't have a foot in the door for the argument mm-hmm. uh, because of the way that our community consumes uh, coaches and structures and, or excuse me, instructors and whatnot. They, uh, I, I'm a small school with 80 jiu-jitsu students, right? So we only open for eight years. And so, you know, they, they only... To get someone to listen to what I have to say is going to be like pulling teeth, yeah. right? So like... It's it, it's it really disappointing for me because I'm like, man, you, most of you guys are doing a great disservice to your community to make a dollar or to or to make yourself famous or just because you're ignorant and just really have no idea. But it sucks to listen to it, man. I'm like, God, I wish I could, 
and get in that conversation. So I'm actually trying to work on that now by talking to you guys, trying to yeah. let people know that I, I maybe know a little, little thing or two. Uh, yeah, I think you're ahead of basically everyone I've ever talked to. I think Scott is right there neck to neck with you, but, um, yeah, dude, you're, 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 you've got the, you've got, you've got the evidence down. Like you've got the basis because you have all your students doing it. You've got, you got your purebred guys coming up. Um, and, uh, I think, yeah, I mean, are you thinking about starting a podcast or a YouTube? I, I would love to just watch your classes. If you just uploaded to YouTube or something. You know what, man? We, we literally just started this last week. I, I'm sort of, been, I've been on this stupid trip. I even said this before, like, you know, you know, Yoda didn't ask Luke to come to Dagobah. He had to go find him kind of thing. And I'm not yeah. trying to say that I'm like, you know, the master to be sought. But in, in my mind, I'm trying to be the deepest level to highly skilled coaching professional that I can. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've always just been concentrating on my room. Like I'm concentrating on yeah. with my guys and being there every day. And I've been so obsessed with being on the mat with them and doing this thing, going to terms with them, doing, doing, I mean, I mean, dealing with personal problems. I mean, I'm telling you, this has been an emotional journey, right? That I really didn't focus on the, the larger community as a whole. And a lot of guys have been asking me to, to, to kind of do this thing. Mm -hmm. I've been I actually, man, ever since I ta started talking to you guys, I've been having two or three phone calls a week. I've been talking to guys in Scotland and England and Canada and, the West Coast. I've been having like two, three hour phone conversations. It's nice. been great. So I realized that, all right, I need to start doing something. And so last week we started filming, well, we started filming a little bit about, you know, how to, how to coach coaches. Uh, we did like a, a little two hour thing and we broke it down. And so we, it was our rough draft. We distilled down to what we need to do. And so Sunday, this Sunday, we're going to work a little bit more. So hopefully the next couple of weeks, we'll have a, some small tutorials on how to form practice around specific movement patterns. Oh, uh, yeah. To give it a little thing, dude. So. I will share that everywhere. I will use it all the time if you put those together. Thank you, man. Yeah, we're, we're <laughs> trying. I'm, I'm, you know, I just want to make sure I'm doing it right. I really, I, I'm sort of, I'm not doing this for any other reason except I, I truly love my job and I want to be good at it, right? I, like I, I remember when I first opened my school, I had this like fear, like this, like this deep intellectual thing that was like, you better know what you're talking about. Yeah. Like, you're going to be taking these people's money and you're going to be telling them that you're teaching them jitsu. So if you don't know what the fuck you're talking about, you're a scumbag. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I just, I, that, that never, that voice never goes away. Every day that I wake up, I'm like, you got to do a better job. You got to do a better job. And even though like, no matter what success my students have or how comfortable I feel with my program, there's more work to be done constantly. I never, yeah. I never let that leave my mind. Yeah. So anyway, I don't know. I'm just bullshitting, but yeah, man. So no, absolutely. So if, if people wanted to find you, reach out to you, where could they reach you at? Honestly, people have been just hitting up my Instagram and, you know, standard Jiu Jitsu, uh, you know, at standard Jiu Jitsu or at GD Souders. Um, you can just message me. You can call my gym phone. I answer all my emails, all my all my texts, all my phone. I mean, I, I engage with all my stuff myself. So if anyone is listening to this and anyone wants to reach out to me and needs help, I'm doing my best. I'm talking to as many people that I can and I'm going to start giving them content. But yeah, reach out to me if anyone's listening to this. So yeah, you can email me, greg at standardjitsu.com. You can hit me up on Instagram at, at standardjitsu uh, or at GD Souders. Uh, yeah, man, I'm available whenever. Awesome, dude. Well, thank you for coming on. And we have, we definitely have to do this again. Yeah, for sure, man. Yeah. If you come up with more questions, if you really, if you listen to this and realize I just kind of too verbose and I was all over the place that we can get more specific. I can, I can come more well prepared next time. So that way I answer all your questions and give you what you need. Yeah, no worries, man. Thanks so much for listening to the Combat Learning Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, remember to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. It really helps us out. Finally, this episode, including the intro music, is produced by Micah Peacock. Thanks in advance, and I'll see you on the next episode.